So we are now on part two of the solo growth model. In part one, we learned about some of the assumptions of the model, like, you know, the households existed, but they weren't explicitly modeled. We knew that they saved a constant fraction of their income. Uh, you know, whatever they save gets invested. Whatever they don't save gets consumed. Uh, we learned that there's a lot of firms. Uh, they all have access to the same production function. Um, production function is Cobb Douglas, which is really nice. It's twice continuously differentiable. It's concave. It's a function that maps in positive Rn space into, well, positive R space of real numbers um, of dimension n. In this case, it's what? Two, I think. Yeah. Into one. Yeah, two is capital labor. Um, and it's positive inputs, positive outputs. This time, what we're going to learn about is um, finding or expressing the constraint in effective labor units or per capita units and finding the steady states and then analyzing the steady states a little bit. So we have the constraint, which we got last time. It's A times K to the alpha times L to the one minus alpha equals C plus that law of motion of capital KT plus one minus one minus delta times KT. And this is currently expressed as an aggregate. And this is thus an aggregate constraint for the economy. Now, why is it a constraint? Because it establishes an equilibrium condition that output has to be exactly split up by consumption and investment. Now, because it's an aggregate, it's describing the whole economy. And recall that for growth, we're really more interested in like the increase in per capita income, not aggregate income. And we can control for the population by getting it down to the individual level. And then we can aggregate it upwards after if that's what we want to do. So because this model assumes that everybody's the same, that there are no preferences describing the household, we're just going to assume that everybody in the economy works and they work the most that they can. This means that if we put it in per capita terms, it's also put in terms of effective labor units because every person in the economy works. So we just divide everything by the labor force and by dividing by the labor force, we divide by the population since the population and the labor force are the same thing. And we can do this because the production function exhibits constant returns to scale. So we divide every endogenous variable by L. And now simplified, we get A times K to the alpha equals C plus KT plus 1 minus 1 minus delta KT. And this implies that any variable in lowercase terms is in per capita terms. Now, when we get to like the business cycle stuff, you'll see it's also going to imply that it's in real terms. So in business cycles, when you see lowercase, it's like real and per capita. Now, A is going to stay capitalized for a couple of reasons. If it shifts the production function up by, say, 1.5, it's going to shift per capita production up by 1.5 as well. Um, and I like keeping it capitalized because it looks cool. But you know, just, I don't know, I'm weird. So this is our resource constraint. It's now per capita. And this gives us something we can actually use. Now, first, we also need to talk a little bit about what the initial resource constraint production function of law of motion of capital would look like in per capita terms. So it's just equations four, five, and six. So really the only thing that's different is you don't have that LT to the one minus alpha in equation five, and then everything is in lowercase as well. Now, you don't have to convert it into per capita terms before you substitute everything out. You don't have to do it after. It's really just a matter of preference. It works either way. Why? Well, because reasons. Now, the slope of the production function, we got to that and we did the marginal products of capital and the marginal products of labor. It's the first derivative of the production function. Now here, with respect to capital, because why? Well, it's, there's no labor anymore. Well, capital is like the uppercase K is like equal to um, uppercase K divided by uppercase L is equal to lowercase K. So technically, it's still it's like implicitly a function of labor, but think of it just like you know it's capital per person. Now this first derivative is so important; it, you know, has its first has its name. 
its own name. It's the marginal product of capital. Kind of went through that before, but it's worth it to say it again. And it measures how much an additional unit of capital contributes to production. So think of it as like a like a change in output given some change in capital. So it's going to be describing the slope of the tangent line at some arbitrary point k naught. So if you have your production function, y equals a times k to the alpha, you get the marginal product of capital, you plug in k naught, or k sub zero, here, the marginal product of capital is going to be the slope at that one point. And if you were to plot out the marginal product of capital itself, so just instead of saying, hey, I want the first derivative, I'm going to plug in k0 and then get this out. If instead of doing that, you just want to plot out the marginal product of capital, the first derivative function, you get this right here. Okay, so if we were to take the derivative of this function with respect to k, you'd have your marginal product of capital. And then you can plug in any value of k that's defined in our domain. We can see how much one more unit of capital would contribute at that point. Now, let's do an example. Okay, so consider the production function y equals at times kt to the one-half. So that first derivative is going to be that like little delta del y over del kt equals one-half times at times kt to the minus one-half. And that's equal to the marginal product of capital, or MPK. So when you take that first derivative, remember, you take this exponent, multiply it by whatever that leading coefficient is, and you subtract 1. So 1 half, now is that, that leading coefficient, and 1 half minus 1 is minus 1 half. So if capital was either 10, 20, or... I think it's 10 here. It's supposed to be 100. What do you know? Magic. I fixed it. It's now k equals 100. So you have 10, 20, or 100. What would the marginal products of capital be? Well, you plug in first k equals 10, k equals 20, and then k equals 100 into equation 8, and you'd evaluate it. So when it's equal to 10, you just plug in 10 for this k sub t right here, and you get 1 half times 10 to the minus 1 half, and that gives you 0 0.158. So that means if you're at 10 units of capital, adding just a little bit more capital, it's going to increase output by 0.158. What's the marginal product of capital when capital is 20? Well, you plug in 20 instead of 10, so you get 1 half times 20 to the power of the of minus one half, and it's 0 0.112. So at 20 units of capital, moving a little bit further up is going to increase output by 0 0.112. Finally, when capital is 100, all right, well, it's one half times 100 to the minus one half, output increases by 0 0.05. So the more capital you put in, you'll always get more output but output's going to be increasing by less and less each time. So that says if we increase capital by, say, a factor of 5, output increases, but by an amount that's way less if output was like 10 or 20. So output increases as we increase capital, but it increases by smaller and smaller amounts the more that we add, which is what's known as a diminishing marginal product of capital. I know I said this before, but it's really important, so I want to say it again. So the function's concave, which implies a positive first derivative and a negative second derivative. Okay, finally, now that we've learned all that stuff, we can finally get to solving out the model. We can solve it by getting steady states for all the endogenous variables. What are the endogenous variables? Well, it's capital, output, investment, and consumption. So first, what is a steady state? Well, remember that fixed point stuff we learned in the dynamical systems? Boom, here it is. This is actually super important. So I'm sure you're probably glad now that you learned it because now you're not super lost going, I don't know what's going on. For a steady state to exist, you're going to have some point k star such that f of k star equals k star. So like f of 1 equals 1 or f of 2 equals 2, something like that. 
in the steady state, there's some amount of capital such that it achieves an optimal path where kt equals kt plus i for all natural numbers i. So like i equals 1, i equals 2, 3, so forth, so on, all that stuff. So there's some amount of capital where everything's going to grow at the same rate. So you can set kt equals kt plus 1 equals kss, where ss indicates steady state. So that amount of capital is going to imply a general equilibrium where all markets will clear. So we'd have ASS times KSS to the power of alpha equals CSS plus KSS minus 1 minus delta times KSS. Now, if you remember the equation for savings, right, you'd have S equals I. Savings is bounded by 0 and 1. So it stands to reason, then, that if CT is equal to 1 minus S times Y, that's equal to 1 minus S times A times K to the alpha. Therefore, investment would equal S times A times K to the alpha. Therefore, KT plus 1 equals S times F of KT plus 1 minus delta KT. And if you were to plug in your Cobb-Douglas production function, you'd get kt plus 1 equals s times a times kt to the alpha plus 1 minus delta times kt. And a steady state equilibrium without any technological progress is an equilibrium path for which k equals k star for all t. So in the steady state, the capital labor ratio is that k, the lowercase k is the capital labor ratio. That guy remains constant. And since there's no population growth, the level of the capital stock also remains constant. So if you take equation 16, put it in the steady state when f of k equals k, it implies kt equals kt plus 1 equals kss. So you have kss equals s times ass, <laughs> bad word, times kss to the alpha plus 1 minus delta times kss. Now, all the k's are the same because, well, fixed point stuff. So you can divide both sides of equation 17 by KSS. So you get KSS over KSS equals S times ASS times KSS to the alpha divided by KSS plus 1 minus delta KSS divided by KSS. And after you reduce some things down, you get 1 equals S. So I'm just going to say A and K from now on. 1 equals S times A times K to the alpha minus 1 plus 1 minus delta. Why is it alpha minus 1? Because if you look at equation 18, you've got k to the alpha divided by k. So if you've got k to the alpha divided by k, that gives you k to the alpha minus 1, giving us equation 19. So let's go ahead and solve for k here. So I'm going to get s times a times k to the alpha minus 1 equals 1 minus 1 minus delta. Well, I can subtract out that 1 to get something a little bit nicer here. I get S times A times K to the alpha minus 1 equals delta. Now I can divide both sides by S times A, and I get K to the alpha minus 1 equals delta over S times A. Now we're almost done, but what I really need to do is something about that exponent. And I can start by raising both sides of this equation 22 to the power of negative 1. When I do that, I flip the numerator and the denominator on the right-hand side, and then instead of getting alpha minus 1 on that left-hand side, I get 1 minus alpha. So I get k to the 1 minus alpha equals s times a over delta. Now I can raise both sides of the equation to the power of 1 over 1 minus alpha, and that gives me steady state capital equals s times a over delta to the power of 1 over 1 minus alpha. So all this math, you kind of need to know what the math is a little bit, but what you really need to know is equation 24. That's the important one. So we have steady state capital, but what's steady state output? Well, output is a function of capital, right? Y equals A times K to the alpha. K, to th K is S times A over delta to the power of 1 over 1 minus alpha. So K to the alpha would just be S times A over delta to the 1 over 1 minus alpha times alpha. So 
I plug in steady state capital and I get this. Y equals A times S times A over delta to the alpha over 1 minus alpha. So that's steady state output. So I've got steady state capital and steady state output. What about consumption? Well, consumption is just 1 minus S times steady state output. So if I take steady state capital, which was given by, well, I guess now equation 27, and go back to that resource constraint, plug some stuff in. Okay, well, it's just all I did was plug in steady state capital everywhere I saw it. If I expand this out, kind of work through some stuff, I get A times S times A over delta to the alpha over 1 minus alpha equals CSS, steady state consumption, plus delta times S times A over delta to the power of 1 over 1 minus alpha. And, well, to solve for CSS, that's steady state consumption. Now, you can also just do 1 minus S times steady state output. So either way would technically be correct. So equation 22 is 1 minus S times steady state output, A times S times A over delta to the alpha over 1 minus alpha. Okay, so let's list off all the steady state variables. Steady state capital, steady state output, steady state investment, what is that? Well, that's just S times steady state output, so it's S times A times S times A over delta to the alpha over 1 minus alpha. And then steady state consumption is the exact same thing, just times 1 minus s instead of times s. So with these four equations for the steady states, for our endogenous variables, we have the set of solutions for the solo growth model. So let's look at steady state capital for a second. Because you saw the math, but now you need to know what the math means. Like, why do we have this math? Well better way to ask this is like, okay, what's going to be increasing things? Is this going to line up with what the economic intuition should be telling us? Think about what's going to increase or decrease steady state capital. Because we've got three things to look at. you got savings, depreciation, and total factor productivity. Let's start with savings. If you increase savings, it means you consume less and invest more. So you're buying more capital. So if you increase the amount of capital you're holding, the steady state for the capital is also going to increase. So increasing savings will increase steady state capital. Here's a nice little hint, right? It's in the numerator. So if you got the numerator of a fraction, the numerator goes up. Well, KSS here is going to go up. All right. Let's look at depreciation, delta. If you increase depreciation, it means capital is falling apart faster. And if capital falls apart faster, all else constant, there's less capital that's available. And if there's less available capital, then an increase in depreciation will decrease steady state capital. Hence, it's in the denominator. If the denominator gets larger, that whole number gets smaller because fractions. All right, now let's look at total factor productivity. Well, that's in the numerator. So you can probably already guess it's going to be increasing steady state capital. And if you guess that, you'd in fact be correct. Total factor productivity goes up. It means that you can use the same number of resources, but produce more with it. It makes capital more efficient. If capital is more efficient, one unit of capital is going to get us a lot farther than it did before. And thus, an increase in total factor productivity increases our steady state capital. Okay, so let's move on to steady state output. This is just steady state capital raised to the power of alpha and then multiplied by A. Both are positive. A is positive. Alpha is positive. So any direction change in steady state capital given by some change in S delta or A is going to yield a similar direction change in steady state output. So if you increase savings or total factor productivity, it's also going to increase steady state output. And if you increase depreciation, that's going to decrease steady state output. Okay, so I theoretically could end the lecture there, but there's one more thing I want to cover, and it's something called the golden rule. And it gives us a nice setup to solve the model for the steady state, which then gives us a savings rate that maximizes consumption, because you got like all these different steady states, 
all these different possible steady states we could be in, but which one is the best one? Because if you got this whole list of them, presumably one's got to be better than something else, and if one's better than one of them, maybe there's something that's better than all of them. And in that case, it's the one that would maximize consumption. So consumption, remember, is 1 minus s times a times k to the alpha. Or it's a times kss to the alpha minus delta kss. Either one works. Now, you can do a lot of math, run, math, run through some calculus, all that stuff. You get this right here. S times A times K to the alpha equals delta times K. All right, one more thing. If you differentiate the consumption function and maximize it, what you'd find is that the consumption function as a function of savings is equal to, well, S times F of KSS. Take that derivative, what you get is f prime of kss equals delta. What does that tell me? Well, don't worry about having to do this math, by the way. That's one thing I'm telling you. But what does this tell me? It tells me if I want everything to stay the same, the only value that makes everything stationary is delta equals s. So the rate of depreciation, whatever that is, you save at the same rate. If depreciation is 5%, then you save 5%. Now, this is, of course, assuming zero population growth. I didn't include any population growth in the model because I just didn't want to get into that, that nitty-gritty math stuff with you guys. Just assume a steady population. If you had population in the model, then it would be the rate of depreciation plus the rate of population growth, say N, would then be the savings rate. And this is what's known as the golden rule. Why is it called the golden rule? Because... It implies that we are treating future generations the way that we would like to be treated. We're allowing future generations to consume as much as we would like to consume. This is the rule that maximizes steady state consumption. So for the golden rule, whatever depreciation is, you save at the same rate. When that happens, you achieve the golden rule and everything stays stationary and we treat future generations the way we would like to be treated ourselves. So that means it maximizes steady state consumption. And because it's maximizing steady state consumption, it maximizes today's consumption, tomorrow's, the day after, so on and so forth. So we treat the future generations the way we want to be treated ourselves. Now, if the economy is below, say, KSSG, we'll say KSSG is the steady state capital given the golden rule, a higher savings rate will actually increase future consumption. If the economy is above KSSG, or steady state capital, given the golden rule, then the economy can actually consume more by saving less. Now, in the second case, saving less means that that capital labor ratio was too high, the households were saving too much, and they weren't consuming enough. This is something known as dynamic inefficiency. Now, all that said, it concludes the lecture for now. If you're a little lost on that golden rule thing, we'll actually learn more about that in the third lecture when we look at the graphs, because the graphs are going to make a lot more sense when you're like, oh, okay, that's where the golden rule makes sense. I get it. By if we're below or above that like optimal steady state value, then you know we can converge to that optimal steady state value. Uh, pictures tend to help sometimes. Um, so this next lecture covers the pictures, the graphical analysis of the steady states for the solo model. And it's going to be the exact same thing that you saw here, but with graphs instead of just cranking out math for the sake of economics. Not math for the sake of math here, thank God. So we're going to learn about changing the parameters in the solo steady states once we look at the graphs, because the graph's really going to give us that good, solid understanding of what's going on. And then you'll go, okay, I get the graph, I get the math, I get the math and the graph, everything's good. Um, and then from there, we can discuss some of the implications of the model how well it works, where it doesn't work, which is then a nice little segue into the neoclassical growth model, which is in, I believe, chapter five. And that's where we get to do the really cool stuff. So um, thanks for watching this. Uh, make sure to uh, really take some good notes over this. Maybe you want to watch the video lecture again. Um, it's what, 25 minute lecture? Yeah, okay, so it really wasn't all that bad. Um, yeah, make sure you take some really good notes because the better you understand this, the better 
you'll be able to understand everything else uh, moving forward. So thanks for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.